so far I've noticed that you have a knack for recognizing good value opportunities with writing a best selling book, uh, jumping on this midterm rental thing and doing that when you didn't have any midterm rental data on that property, and then finding this tree house and and doing that as well. So I think you might need to keep doing real estate. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Daily Real Estate Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Josiah Smelser. Got my co-host, Tony Moreno here. And today we've got a guest on the show that I think you're really going to enjoy. Her name is Rachel Swanson. Rachel, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah. Man, so I've been um, tracking with you on Instagram and I really enjoy enjoying your post. Um, saw some really cool stuff you're doing with short-term and mid-term rentals. Thought that would be, really be interesting to the audience and uh, wanted to have you on the show, let you share your story and fill us in on how these midterm rentals work and your, you know, the short-term rentals you own. Tell us more about that and also know that you are a best-selling author. So let's start with that. What was the, the book that you wrote that did so well? Yeah. Oh, thanks. So yeah, I um, launched a book in 2017 that was called Big and Little Coloring Devotional and it was it was really, uh, you know, at that stage, I mean, just give you a paint a picture real quick. You know, my life was I was a busy mom, still entrepreneur type of person of three kids under two years old at that time, or, or maybe you know, they were under three. So I have twin boys. And then my daughter was 19 months apart. So a little overwhelmed, a little crazy. And I remember um, one day I was sitting down with my daughter and she, so she wanted me to color. She's like, mommy, mommy, come color with me. So I go over there and I'm coloring with her. And um, me personally, like faith and just spiritual nourishment is a big part of my life. And so for me to just feel grounded, I need some of that. And so when I'm starting to sit there and coloring with her, I pulled out my phone that has like a devotional app on it. And I start reading like a devotional. And of course, my daughter's like, mommy, mommy, pay attention. Like, you know, you can tell that she's like, she wants my eyes. She wants my engagement. And I just thought, man, there's got to be a way I can, you know, color with her and do some, you know, spiritual engagement with her at the same time. And at that time, I was um, in a coaching program learning about how to become an author, all that kind of stuff. Um, actually, this was like 2015, 16. And uh, that's just when I kind of had this idea that came to my head. Of, I was like, oh, well, maybe there's a book like this online. And sure enough, I go to Amazon and check it out to try to see if I could find a coloring devotional with kids and adults and nothing. And at that time, it was actually really just a good timing because that was when that, you know, the adult color books were kind of all the rage. And so, um, yeah, I just, I had this, you know, thought and I thought, okay, I'm just going to try it and pitch it. And, um, you know, there's a lot more story behind that, but long story short, it, it launched and I mean, it became a national bestseller on the bestselling list. It was like the top 50, um, for the month. And, uh, yeah, it just did really, really well. Sell, sold tens of thousands of copies and uh, kind of launched me onto my book story and, and writing author and journey. So that was pretty fun. That's incredible. Kudos to you for taking the leap on that and just pressing in and and doing that. Did, did you self publish or how did you publish it? No, I um, I did publish through. It was it's one of the top publishers on the Christian publishers um, side, and so they are through Lifeway, which is um, because publishing. Yeah, Lifeway used to have a lot of bookstores, and actually, well, how it did so well is really it became it was the number one book of, of that they were displaying at that time and they ran a special promotion and so every single person that's back when they had the stores but every single person that came in they were literally telling like hey you should you know should take a look at this like you know grab this book at the same time at the at checkout and so i think that's also why it did so well not, not only did it do well because of that but i mean it did it was a really cool idea a unique idea um yeah so it, it did pretty well that's yeah. awesome T and tell us the name of that one more time Big and Little Coloring Devotion. Okay, we'll definitely yes. put a link to that in the show notes for those of you that want to check that out. Yeah, I uh, I wrote a book a few years ago and self published that, and that was a uh, that was an interesting experience. So, uh, but I learned a lot. I enjoyed it. I, I would be interested in writing another book at some point. But but let's dive into your your story. So tell us where you're located and um, and how you got into real estate investing. Yeah. So now I am currently located in Texas. Um, we, I have to share, let's see, we originally, I'm originally from California. We moved to Idaho um, and we're living there for about the past four to five years. And then we just moved to Texas. And so we have rentals. We actually started our um, rentals in Idaho. So we still have some there. And then when we moved to Texas, we now bought some here. And we also now have one in Oklahoma, um, a cabin. So we're kind of spread out, but I do think 
Um, at this point, I'm probably going to hone in on these areas and just capitalize on these areas at this time. Is, is there a specific reason why you're honing in? You know, yeah, it, I think it can be, I mean, in the beginning, it's really fun to just start looking at all these different markets and you want to just start picking everything. I mean, I want to be in Florida. I want to be in you know, whatever, especially if you're short term rental, you know, you're looking for these really unique, cool spots. But at some point, you know, when you start setting them up, you start to realize how hard it is to go in a new market every single time. And you don't have mm -hmm. to find all your new people, your contractors, your maintenance people, your cleaners, like it just takes a lot of time and energy. Whereas if you already have one that's really performing well in a market, it might be, I mean, it's definitely going to be easier. And if you can find another one that can perform well in the same place, you're not having to do all that extra research and all that extra time and energy finding your people. You have your people and you can just plug them right into that. So mm. that's, that's another reason it just saves a lot more time and energy. And um, I just, I like my people that I have on, on board. So I want to try to utilize them as much as possible. Okay. So for those that don't know, how how did where did you get started in real estate as far as when where did you buy your first property and what was your mindset during that time? Yeah. Well, so ironically, I found me 2020 hit and that's actually, um, I kind of have to share a little bit of backstory, but that's when, you know, things kind of took a big slip on the author side of my world. Everything basically fell apart. Um, you know, it's funny. I looking at hindsight, it was like, the best worst situation ever type of thing. I mean, it launched me into what I now know is even uh, just better overall for um, so many different reasons. Uh, so in 2021, that's when I started to really um, you know, hit the real estate stuff hard. I read, you know, the rip everybody talks about rich dad, poor dad, just really with life changing. And then I read about 40 other books because I'm a reader and I'm really fast at reading. I probably read those in about a month. Um, cause I just wanted to learn everything I could before I dug into real estate and, and figure that out. So we, um, I got my husband on board by trying to actually start reading out loud to him. So by <laughs> this is the difference. So, so I'm actually the more the business uh, person he's not, uh, so I have to really help him understand. I mean, he's, he's on board now, but, uh, you know, I'm the one that takes risks. I'm the one that pushes forward. I'm the one that, that charges in it, but he is my stable, um, voice that tells me like, okay, if you do this one, like we definitely are not going to have the financials or, you know, this one, you need to pull that on whatever. He, so he's my sound voice. But all that to say in 2021, that's when we really started to dig in. Um, one big property, it was a pretty, and it, looking back, it was still a pretty big risk, but um, we decided to buy, but it was also very life changing. We decided to buy this property that was an assisted living home that mm. was basically vacant. Um, the guy, you know, obviously after 2020, I think things got kind of crazy in the assist assisted living world and um, home health type of stuff. And so some people were pulling their parents or you know loved ones and grandparents and stuff out of these places. And so, and he was at the point where it was super funny. Like he, he was in his eighties and he was like, you know, when you start to take care of people that are older or sorry, younger than you, you start to realize, I think I should retire <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> um, so he had this vacant assisted living property. And at the time we could see there was a huge need for, um, for affordable housing. And this place had nine bedrooms and we thought, you know what, we could do what's called that co-living kind of concept. And, um, you know, furnish or, or furnish the place, but have the room separate. And, uh, and and really maximize the profits on this place because we knew we would get a good deal on it. And then moving forward, that just ended up being such a life-changing property. We also learned so much. I mean, it's one of those, I feel like I got 10 years worth of real estate just in that one project in 18 months, you know, because I learned about city permitting. I learned about zoning. I learned about all these things. I just, you know, uh, learned about how to set up a midterm rental. And so in sense, that was actually how I learned how to maximize set up midterm rentals, right out to nurses, because we started doing that with a lot of rooms and converting them into um, rooms that were furnished. And um, yeah, it just was a really great property. And then that, I feel like gave me the confidence to keep moving forward um, into a lot of other areas of real estate. So that's awesome. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in that story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, first, I don't think, just I don't think we've ever had anybody speak on um, assisted living or uh, co-living. Is that what you called it? Yeah, co-living. Uh, so uh, uh, is there a difference between those two? Yes. Okay, let's, let's break that down. So okay. co-living is a concept where you can basically take just even, just think about like even a house, like a four-bedroom house. 
Mm-hmm. And if you rent it out every room separate, like to separate people who don't know each other, right? And yes. you rent it, but you furnish all of it to like, or you furnish the main parts. You could have, let them have their own stuff. Um, there's different types of co-living. Some are fully furnished and some are just furnishing the main areas and letting them bring in their own personal stuff for their bedrooms. And you charge a certain rent. Um, mm-hmm. You as the owner, as the landlord, you would still pay for all the utilities, all the internet. You pay for everything. But because you can rent by the room, you can typically charge um, you know, a little more than you would charge for an entire house to be rented for, say, a family. And there's a benefit to both sides because even though you can charge a little bit more for the room, you can still charge considerably less than what um, somebody looking for like a one bedroom apartment or, you know, would be looking at in that area. And so it's kind of this mix between helping on the affordability side Mm -hmm. of renters, as well as maximizing your investment, say on a house or a really big facility. Like we, we kind of dived into just actually an assisted living home um, that was already kind of set up for that. But um, yeah, so this one already, you know, this was a unique property. I mean, every property is going to be different, but you can do it, like I said, as simply as like a three or four bedroom house, right to melt by the room, or you can go something really big. You know, I know some people that are doing massive projects where they, you know, have like hundreds, even I mean, if you go like other countries, actually, there's other countries that do this co-living concept for me and have it like a hundred, you know, people are, it's like a compound, you know, <laughs> it's just crazy. But yeah, so we didn't do it that crazy, but, um, Yeah. So we started doing that. There was a lot of hurdles in that. And then we converted some of the rooms, about half of them ended up being converted to midterm rental for nurses. Um, And we did that for a few different reasons, but um, we, we just also saw the need because that was also during that COVID time. And um, there was just a lot of an increase in need for nurses to have a nice place to live. It's safe or whatever and is furnished. And so we thought, you know, we can, we can do that as well. It even charge a little bit more and having nurses in there was just great because it changed the dynamic from just, um, I don't know. I don't know how to share this without like sounding anyway, like, you know, it, it's, there, there's a different mindset with people when they're in that place, when they are a single person, that's kind of struggling. I mean, they're working, but it's, it's a struggle. I don't know. And they're single and yeah. And so being in this co-living place that sometimes there were some, I mean, there, we had a lot of applicants, but most of them were not great, right? Like mm-hmm. want to accept they have like previous felonies or, you know, that just different things or you're like, I'm not bringing you in. Like this is a shared environment. I want it to be safe. And so there are a lot of complexities with the whole co-living thing. You have to think through when it comes to like, yeah, it is a shared space. So how do you make sure that people will feel safe? Uh, right. room you have to make sure they have their own special lock um the outside doors we actually ended up making it to where it was key cards kind of like a hotel because that way not anybody could just walk in or you know walk out you just you had to have a specific key card to open that main outside door so that way it just prevents any other wandering looky loo or whatever pretending like they they live there from coming in that way you know everybody inside there is somebody who's supposed to be there um, we have flowers on the outside just to keep things, you know, safe and designated parking spots for people just so that people weren't upset. So we had like house rules inside about keeping the kitchen clean. We had a cleaner even come in every single week to do like some light cleaning in the kitchen and those types of spaces. So there's a lot of things to make it run smoothly that we worked through. Um, and, and it was actually a really great property by the time we ended up selling it, um, you know, which we did and because we could just maximize all the cash that and, and equity that we gained from it to other properties instead. So. so is there anything additional in assisted living? Do you add any other services aside? From- well, so assisted living, sorry. So that was co-living. Assisted living is different. So that's a whole other category where it is truly just for um, typically elderly people, right? Or people that have um, mobility or, or physical issues, or it's people that need care, right? So they go to these assisted living homes and and there is a manager on site and also nurses who come in and help and take care of their needs, deliver medication, things like that. Uh, okay. That is a, a specific, like insurances will even cover for those types of people. And that's a whole different business structure. And so, yes, we while we took the same, like this building, we converted it to a different business is what basically I would, I would say with the co-living model, but the the assisted living, I don't actually have experience with that because I didn't run an assisted living home, but, 
I just, I just know that that, you know, it's a totally different thing. And it's something that if you were to acquire an assisted living home, you usually have to go through a new permitting process to get a conditional use permit to do what's called a rooming house is uh, a lot of the term terminology is what other cities are calling it, um, where you rent by the room and then that's allowable, but yeah. So this is super interesting stuff. So you found an assisted living, was this assisted living facility vacant when you bought it or were they currently operating it as assisted living or how did you, how did you put this together? I'm curious about this. Okay. Okay. So he, he was still running it. So here, here's, here's even more. So he had this assisted living. It was a nine bedroom, 11 bath. And then he had bought this three bedroom, two bath next door. And he converted um, the parcels and his plan was to create and build out the 16 unit uh, assisted living. It was right in the middle of like a normal bit, like neighborhood. So I don't even know how he got it approved like that. But um, so anyways, he got that approved. And so when we were coming in, even though he had those approvals, uh, you know, he just realized he didn't have the money or whatever. He was just ready to, to sell. The sell coin, we just knew with the price of it, we knew we could easily parcel off the house and sell it and put it back in, you know, no matter what, like we're like, okay, this is a good deal because of the fact it had the house attached. Um, and, and we didn't buy the business. We just bought the, the, you know, the building. Um, so he was already kind of on his way out. So it was pretty easy when we went, when, when we went in and talked to him and we told him what our idea was and he wasn't, you know, opposed to, he's like, yeah, I can just shut down the business. I can let go of these last couple people that he has. So he really didn't have that many people he had to move out. Um, so yeah, by the time we bought it, you know, we, uh, nobody was in it. It was vacant. Uh, then we went in and did a bunch of remodeling, um, and, uh, and then got those ones, room, you know, rooms less r- listed, ready for rent. And then the house next door, we actually rented it initially as is, um, it was a great, like I had good bones, but it really just was like the carpet was shot. The walls need a new paint, you know, just things like that. Some of the things weren't needing updating. Um, and then it wasn't until like maybe six or eight months went by, we decided, you know what, I think it's better if we can just lightly renovate this and parcel it off and sell it um, and put it back into this other property that we have. And so we did that as well. Um, so that part was just the house. The main part was the co-living and yeah, the co-living community was, I mean, we always had it hundred percent rented. I mean, it was very rare that it was not rented. So based off of our pricing and what we pro- um, provided, we really, uh, I think we provided a, a really good place to live at a pretty affordable cost and it, and it made great money still for us as well. So that was great. So were the neighbors good with this co-living situation or did you get any blowback there? And was this, was this permitted and how, how does that, how does that work with something like this? Like my, 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 uh, assumption is that, you know, because I own short-term rentals, uh, that in a neighborhood people would frown upon co-living and that it would be hard to get permits or, you know, it'd hard to get approval from the government entities on this. I'm assuming that once you have it though, you're good. Right. But, um, it would seem like like you were talking about with, with more transient type people being in and out of there, they would probably create more traffic and whatnot in the neighborhood. And you know how neighborhoods are, they like keeping things quiet and, and you know how they are. There, there's some, there can be some folks that just don't like stuff other than what, what the traditional route is. So how was that? Well, I think because this one was already an assisted living home. And so there was already nurses coming to and from the property. There were, you know, people that were living there, but obviously sometimes they live there only a few months and then they have somebody else coming in or their families coming to visit. And so there was already actually probably more traffic than what we were actually going to provide. And so showing and proving that we had to definitely go to the city and share that with them of like, Hey, this isn't actually any different. If, if anything, this is um, less traffic and less busyness than you would typically see. Cause even though, yeah, we had a few nurses that were there and they would be there for just like three months at a time. And then they leave like most of the time though, they're still, it's not like they're causing any more traffic. I mean, they just go to, you know, work and then they come back. And, um, as long as we had the parking designated, it was fine. But, uh, 
Yeah, so so we didn't have a lot of pushback back with that. Um, we did have a neighborhood. We had to have a neighborhood meeting. That was interesting. Um, it was good actually. That we, we it was scary at first because I thought for sure people were like going to be like, no, <laughs> you don't want this. But once we explained to them and told them, hey, like this is our, you know, this is our goal. This is what we're doing. These are all the things that we, we basically tried to think through. What are all the different things that people would have an issue with, and do we have a solution, and can we make sure that they feel comfortable about that? And so talking to them about how we do have cameras on every single outside place so that it's not going to be a place where, um, you know, we're just letting in anybody or there's going to be transient people that are uh, going to damage the property and whatnot. Um, you know, where we had outside locks that, you know, prevented whatever, uh, where we had like nurses that they had to be background checked. Every single person had to be background checked. Nobody was allowed in that had any sort of felony or previous like sexual problem that, you know, was, was um, yeah. In, in their past history. So uh, sharing all that really gave everybody a lot more comfort. And then also sharing again that, you know, it's only one person per bedroom, 100%. Like nobody can rent that's like two people. Like we're not housing, like we're not like a hostel and trying to cram as many people in as possible, right? Like to a room, like we have limits and we don't have any pets. So there's not going to be barking dogs. And so uh, all of those things help to, I think, mitigate the stressors that people had. And so when we did have that meeting, um, neighbors were actually like really positive like wow this sounds like a really cool place we love the idea so i don't know like everybody was positive about it we didn't have anybody that was um a big naysayer actually to be which was fantastic i know maybe that's not always the case but again i think because this property was already running as an assisted living uh, facility before it wasn't much different than what we were you know with, with what we were converting it to so i think that gave um a little more leeway. If you had, say, a five bedroom house and you're doing this in a normal neighborhood, you know, I could see where that could be a little more on the uh, iffy side with neighbors or the city. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so two follow up questions here. Number one, I put my appraiser hat on and I, I think, how did you, on the front end, not owning one of these, how did you underwrite this? How did you? Get your arms around what you thought the rents were going to be on this. And and then my second question would be, I think it's brilliant that you're targeting nurses, right? That are, have the three-month stays. How did you land that client and how did you feel... How did you feel a level of comfort with the fact that that was your business plan and that you could execute on that? Okay. Let me, let me think. Sometimes I have a hard time with two questions at the same time. Let's start with the appraisal question. How did you underwrite? Yeah, that part was tricky. I will be honest. So when we first bought the property, we um, when it went through the appraisal, so we had to go through a commercial loan because it was a assisted living. Now, that was interesting, right? We didn't have a lot of background. We had one, no, two rentals under our belt at this time, like normal single family rentals. So I went to a bank. We found a a good bank that was, you, you basically have to prove to them that you can deliver and do what it is that you wanted to do. Um, it, it was, it, now looking back, I realized like we, that was a pretty incredible process, how a lot of things worked out. And uh, cause even going to the, the, this um, bank and sharing our idea and having to, like basically give them a whole presentation of what we're doing, why there's a need. We did have to prove to them and show them all the research that we did. Uh, I did some preliminary research or did some preliminary um, testing where I even just put out a listing of like, this is available for rent, you know, and just to see. And we literally had like 50 applicants in 10 days. I mean, it was... That's so smart. Yes, this, yeah. And so we were showing them, hey, look, there is a need. Like this is a, obviously people would would take this, you know, because there were a few. There was one person in particular in the upper hand of this loan company, right? That was like, this isn't going to work, like blah, 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 blah. And I had to show them all this proof, like, no, this is actually working. And then on the appraisal side, that was interesting. So we had an appraiser go out and he... I talked with him and he was like, so how are we appraising this now? <laughs> you know, and then I had to show him how I was like, okay, this is our plan. Um, this is very similar to what you would look at as like a studio or one bedroom apartment. And he actually did do that. So he basically did, he, he did, he did an appraisal based off of 
Um, what, you know, would the what house each bedroom would rent to. And then what this would be. And it, so he had it broken down a couple different ways. And, uh, and that, you know, it worked. It, it was enough to show to the bank that like, hey, this is something that uh, will still perform. Now, on the, on the flip side, it was very difficult. We were trying to do a refinance at one point uh, about a year into owning it where we wanted to keep it but pull the cash out. And at this point, we we um, wanted to try to do a residential loan. And the appraiser came out. Actually, we had three appraisers go out and they were like, I can't appraise this thing. I don't know how to appraise it. You had the wrong appraiser. Yeah. So on the residential side for this one, they were like, I have no idea what to do. And I finally got one that he said, you know what? You need to do what's called a narrative appraisal. I guess a narrative appraisal. And you're like, so you're like, yeah, uh, is like, and you probably could share more on that. But uh, I guess it's like where you, it's more of like a breakdown of like a summary of like your, sh- I don't even know exactly, but it's it's on, it's on the verge of like hybrid with like commercial. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. But, uh, and then when we went to sell it, uh, we also, again, like the appraiser was the biggest issue because when we went to sell it, we had told the seller, or sorry, the buyers, we're like, you cannot, because we knew we had all these issues with trying to get appraised before. And so we said, look, we you cannot use a normal appraisal. They, they, the appraiser will go out there and they won't know what to do. Like you cannot do that. You have to go either through a narrative appraisal or do some sort of commercial type of appraisal. Like it has, even though it, it runs it, it's under, it was even zoned residential, but I was like, it was like a commercial property. Like you can't really appraise it as a residential. So, uh, so yeah, they said, oh yeah, we're fine. We'll figure, you know, whatever. Sure enough, they put out a residential appraiser who went out and apparently though, he was like, oh, I can do this. Well, he appraises it like, what was it? It was like $250,000 less than what it was actually valued because he didn't take any income, none of it. And I'm like, no, you can't base this based off of just the building. Like this is at this point, this is a commercial property and we want it based off of the rents because you could see the rents. Um, like, for example, I think he appraised it $850,000 and our, uh, what we were trying to get was like 1.1 million. Like we knew it would appraise more of like that amount. And he didn't appraise it at that. Well, uh, Somehow they were her bank, like their loan company. That everybody actually knew that was bogus, that that was not how it should have been appraised. But they didn't even get somebody else out there, but they they just saw and they knew the proof with all the rents and the cash flow coming in that then the bank and I don't know, they decided, you know what, we're going to go for it anyways. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how that worked, but they just basically threw that out the window throughout the appraisal. And we're like, you know what, we still feel like this is, you know, worth um, spending what what they ended up spending like a little over a million, you know, um, we put we dropped drop the price down a little bit. Um, but otherwise, yeah, so that is the one trickiest part I would say for this would be, and that is probably the riskiest part is like, how do you get it appraised? And is it going to appraise for what you want it to appraise for? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I appraised a midterm rental one time. And um, the interesting thing about, you know, a single family house in a residential neighborhood zone single family is I, I think the one I was appraising wasn't even permitted. I don't think they had told anyone. I think they had just kind of gone in and put locks on the different bedrooms and we're doing this. Well, you know, what you're supposed to do as the appraiser is appraise it based on its zoning. Unless you, unless you have a subject to appraisal, you're, you're, you appraise it as is. So if it's zoned single family residential and midterm is not allowed under that zoning then you have to appraise it to its highest and best use under the single family residential zoning so i appraised this property that i did as a single family house were it to sell as a single family house and i couldn't use midterm rents i had to use a a year lease because the the lender wouldn't accept midterm rents the lender does it because they say that's harder to underwrite right because they're like well, we have all these one-year lease comps, but we don't have the midterm rental comps. That's why I was so curious about where you got your midterm rental data, because that's really the value driver of this whole thing. And uh, kudos to you for somebody telling you that this wouldn't work and then going and testing and verifying that this hypothesis that you had was correct. And that is why you created so much value with this. 
And that's a recurring theme I see with successful real estate investors and entrepreneurs is that they, they'll come up with an idea, they'll hear somebody tell them this, not, this is not going to work or multiple people, and they'll continue and test it. And then they'll observe the data. And if the data shows that it's going to work, they go forward with it. And, um, and yeah, that, I mean, that's awesome that y'all figured that out and that you did this and created so much value with this. Um, and then, you know, my, my other question was, how did you, how did you advertise to nurses? Like how, how did you find that little niche and get in there? Because that seems like the honey hole with this. Yeah. Yeah. So that line, uh, I mean, furnished binders and Airbnb with like 30 day stays or more are the two that we used for this property. And they, um, you know, between both of those, we just found some great, you know, nurses that came in and I mean, they're just the best because they just, they don't keep them. No, they're low key. They don't, you know, they keep things clean. They just, I don't know. They're they're so busy and exhausted from their work too. Anyways, like they just want to come home and have a safe place that they can just put their head down and and enjoy. So, um, yeah, we I just advertised on there. I just had you know having good pictures, right, and making sure you're very clear on what the expectations are. I think that was really key. So I probably over uh, did on on the description part of like what this place is like and what it was, you know. And I also t- I constantly was telling people I will get on the phone with you to talk it through just so they feel like. I'm a real person. I'm not trying to scam them that this is legit, whatever. And so because of that, it just gave that a lot of like, like, you know, trust and I kept, you know, people were willing to do it. And then, uh, yeah, so I, I even got some, I mean, not just nurses, but they were just travelers, like random travelers, right? Like there's just guys that are, you know, working remotely and they just want to travel the world or travel around and explore different places. So I got one dude, he was there for like a month. He wanted to just like check out Boise and check out Idaho and he loved it, you know, and he was super easy and super chill. And so you just, you know, when you advertise it, I think just making sure if you advertise this type of property, you just are very clear on um, what is provided and the expectations and make sure the pictures are really good. Um, and that, that to me, that just kind of sold it and nailed it. Uh, and then pricing, right? Like you got to figure out the pricing. So just doing research, like checking out and seeing, okay, what are other furnished rentals um, that are kind of like rented by the room? Like, what are those offering right now? Um, The one little benefit we had with this is it was, you know, it was, I I did say it's a studio like room for rent. So it's that in between where I could push a little bit more rent than your normal, just, you know, Joe Schmo saying he's going to rent out his bedroom and he lives there. I could tell people, look, the landlord, the owner does not live on site. It is all working travel, traveling professionals. Like you're going to be with your people. Right. And, um, and yet it's not full studio, right? You still have some shared areas and stuff, but you do still have your own like space for your you know bedroom. Many of them had their own bathrooms to attach. There was only like two or three units that shared the bathroom but then again that was clean professionally every week and so you know going above and beyond kind of showing them hey this is what we're providing and this is what some of the differences are but this is also the value that you're getting and that helped really nail in some of these um yeah travelers that were wonderful and and increased the rents a lot more dramatically yeah so with that point for our listeners a rental is not just a 12 month lease you can get creative and maximize your cash flow um by renting by the room and there's you know multiple ways you got a midterm stays then you have you know short-term stays which is Mm -hmm. the usually we can stay airbnb that we see for the most part um so that's i mean that's awesome if you if there's a property there are a lot of markets that are really hard um to cash flow this is a way that you can potentially cash flow with the same property um and i believe rachel that's what you guys did which is which is great and me personally that's what i did with uh my my previous home it's a midterm rental. Um, okay. I, I have it listed in Airbnb, VRBO, but I also have it listed in Furnish Finder. And then mm-hmm. I also created a, a website of its own, um, paying Google ads to pop it up whenever somebody types Huntsville, Alabama, either short-term stay or corporate stays, it'll pop up. That's another way that I do it. So for the listeners, okay. if you want to get into that strategy, that's definitely a good way. However, I will say, <laughs> however, it takes a lot more work than just a 12-month rental. Um, just keep that in mind. We'll dive deeper into that. But what else are you Rachel, doing, Tony? That I don't know about. You didn't tell me about your midterm rental. Well, it, it's the same. It's the same short-term rental. I advertise it. Uh. I push to advertise it more for midterm rentals uh. because you know Airbnb. 
it's a lot more hands on their turnover. You know, you got every week you got one, two turnovers. However, I have a guy that actually found me on Furnish Finder. He's at a, his company has a construction project going on and he's been there since April. His contract was supposed to end September. He called me about three weeks ago saying, hey, we might extend to December. And I was like, dude, you got it. The house is yours. I mean, the guy, he doesn't bug me much. Uh, 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 we haven't had any issues at all. And literally this dude is paying like three times the rent. That is insane. Three times the rent? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. And again, the house is, the house is furnished, everything. Um, everything is paid for, internet, utilities. Um, the only thing he has to worry about is his own food, pretty much. Yeah, I have a midterm rental as well, where I'm getting almost three times what your long-term rental rents are. And they're just the best. <laughs> well, the best. well, I've got seven fishing cabins on the lake in Guttersville. And we've actually had some midterm renters uh, contact us about this. And we are not even on Furnished Finder which we're about to do that for when this podcast ends. So we're about to put those on there because that, man, I mean, that sounds like a great solution because you know, another thing it does for you, you know, we're renting these short term right now. It cuts down on the cleaning costs significantly. Yes. I would yeah, say and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you. I think you were going to say it. Go ahead. Well, I actually, so there are some midterm rental people. I'm one of them that actually will have their cleaner come in midstay uh for their people and i'm and i have a much sh smaller um price for that like she's not going in and doing deep cleaning or anything and so kind of what why she's doing that is she's my eyes and ears as well to see and like check in and see if they're you know being good to the place whatever and as well as it just doesn't take like say if they're there for months and months like you don't want them not cleaning or you know otherwise it's like a huge bigger cleaning at the end of the lot, you know, the next month or two when they're out and it just kind of saves it on that end. But um, I will say that still cuts down on your cleaning costs from, you know, short term rental uh, compared to midterm. Yeah. Okay. So fast forward now to today, where are you at as far as units and, and what are the strategies and properties uh, do you have? Yeah. Um, so I have seven units that are long-term rentals. Um, one's a fourplex and one's a duplex and then one's a single family house. And then I have um, two short-term rentals and one midterm. And then I have my own uh, property management company. I call it like a boutique property management company because I only do a handful of clients and, and that's not my main focus anymore. Um, but initially it was really just because in Idaho where I was, it was kind of a rural area and there weren't great property management companies. So I was like, figure, I'm like, oh, I'll just create my own. So, um, so I, I did that. And it was also just when I was learning, you know, with real estate and stuff, and I just figured I was going to be hands on anyways. So, um, so I, I have that with some clients as well. And, um, yeah, that's it. But, uh, yeah, three of the properties that we do own outright, um, because we just, when we sold our, uh, that co-living, you know, community, um, property, it was at the same time where we were moving and we were trying to get into our new house and, uh, and then interest rates were higher. Right. And so truth, truth be told, it was going to be so it was, it was very, it could have been detrimental trying to get loans for additional properties at the time. So we were like, you know what, let's just pay cash for these, like divide it with three, you know, do a 1031 exchange, right. Um, get three properties and, um, and then we can always do a cash out or like a refinance later, you know, pull the money out to invest further. And so we did that. And it's been great because it has increased our cash flow quite a bit because, um, you know, one of those is our short term rental that just is a cash cow. And so it just helps a lot right now. But so let's let's talk about that one. Tell me about that. The cash cow. The cash cow. Yeah. So this one is a unique gem. It's our little gem property. We found this amazing um Actually, I think at the time it was three bedroom. We converted to a four, but it's a three bedroom on a lake in Texas. And it's a tree house, considered one of those tree house properties. And the funny thing is, <laughs> I didn't even realize it was a tree house property until like after we were in contract. It was so funny. <laughs> um, I was like, oh yeah, like, cause it, it's like up on stilts, right? Stilted, except for the driveway. Like the, the garage is like, you have a driveway and you can get into the garage, but then the garage is detached from the main part of the house. And so you walk through a breezeway. Well, it's mostly detached. It's, it's like there's a breezeway and up the steps. And so the, all the main house is up on these stilts. And then in the backyard, 
the patio has all these trees going through, you know, the, the wood, um, the deck, you know, the deck. And so there's all these huge, beautiful trees, like just surrounded. The whole place just feels like you're in a tree house because there's so many trees around and wood property and everything. And then you have some of these skylights. And so then you can see the trees. So yeah, it's a pretty fun kind of experience. And so this one, you know, was one of those we were, I do think it was right place at the right time, but we were actively searching for something like this, like a property on the lake, yada, yada. And we were about to actually, we had just looked in that same kind of area, but there was a different property that was for sale, half the price, but also very small. It was like a, well, they, they said it was a two bedroom, two bath. It was really like a one bedroom, one bath. And uh, like a loft was not enclosed. And then there was a bathroom in the garage that was like, I mean, it looked like somebody had, you know, murdered somebody in there. There was, it was pretty bad. So, uh, yeah. So that one we were in, we, there were so many issues with it. We're like looking at, we're like, we're trying to love it. Right. And then I think, okay, there's gotta be another house in this area. Like this is such a cool little area on the lake or whatever. And, uh, sure enough, I had looked and I just looked and had just popped on. And I, when I saw the pictures, cause the, the, the property is just so unique. It's not like anything else you'd see around here. And inside, they just use these really interesting and cool materials. I mean, it has this industrial kind of vibe, but um, has slate everywhere, like huge plank wood. Like, it's just very unique. And so as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's it. And so we, I told my husband, I'm, I'm putting an offer on this one site and seeing we're just going to get it. And so sure enough, we uh, put it in. And it was one of those, again, those, the guy, he had owned it for six years and I, I sound like he had some personal issues going on and mental issues going on. So I think when he just got the offer, he was like, I'm done. Like I'm out. So, and it was all cash. Right. So he was pretty happy about that. Um, we still have inspections and all that. And, um, you know, after inspections, we saw like, yeah, there's a lot of deferred maintenance, but it's nothing crazy. You know, we, we knew it was all super doable. And then the biggest part of this one. So we did turn it into a four bedroom. So the garage, um, just behind like, so there's the main part of the garage and then there's a door and then there's a whole other room that was huge, which would have probably been like, I don't know, maybe an extra storage area or a huge workshop area. And it also had a bathroom, <laughs> again, quote bathroom. It was like, it had, but it had the plumbing, right? It had all the plumbing yeah, yeah. in the toilet area. And, um, but it was all just kind of stored. And we thought, oh, this could be used as like a bunkhouse space. We could easily get nine people in here, like a triple bunks and and it has this beautiful skylight and everything. So we thought this is great. And we, we realized once we put in all the math and all the numbers and how much we could rent this for, we were like, oh wow, this is going to be amazing value add. And so we decided to do that and rent out the whole place where it can sleep 17 people um, wow. pretty comfortably. Yeah. And uh and yeah, so people are just, I mean, it, it's literally rented every single weekend up until, you know, I think December, we finally have a couple openings. And then um, July was our biggest month. I think we had it rented, gosh, so much. I think our gross was almost 17000 for the month, which for just wow. watching it in the last couple, like two months before that, I feel like that's pretty, it's pretty good. Yeah, but, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a similar experience with the the nicer, larger vacation rentals that we own that have more unique amenities. Um, and so I think I think you're you're on to the same thing. Like these these treehouse short term rentals, they have a unique offering to the renter, which is a unique experience. And what I'm seeing in the short-term rental space is the more unique experience you can offer, the you know the more booked up you are, and the more you can make on your property. So, um, super cool that you're able to recognize that. You so far, I've noticed that you have a knack for recognizing good value opportunities with writing a best-selling book, uh, jumping on this midterm rental thing, and doing that when you didn't have any midterm rental data on that property, and then finding this tree house and and doing that as well so i think you might need to keep doing real estate <laughs> you're, you're now, doing, you know, you're I would probably on uh yeah you know and, and i have to say i did know my husband's not you know he doesn't like to do any podcasts or whatever like he is literally 
he's the behind the scenes, the silent, like invisible person that just makes everything work too, because you have no idea. He has put so, he's the DIY guy. He hands on, does so much work for these properties. And I always feel bad because I'm like, sorry, babe, I got another project for you, you know? And, uh, <laughs> but at this time, we still are really in a place where we're maximi maximizing our equity and growth. And so he just wants and needs to do a lot of the work if he can. Um, because it just saves us so much more money. We still do have contractors and stuff that work with us, and and we do hire out um, a lot more things. But um, but yeah, he he helps me see some of that creative vision. I have to give him a shout out. He was the one who thought of that one, the bunkhouse space. So normally I do think of those things, but he he thought of that one. But uh, I would actually just to add with your what you shared. Yes, I think properties. So I know this one it kind of hits on both because it's not only unique but also serves a ton of people. Uh, which not a lot of treehouse properties do. Most of them are really small and for just, you know, a couple people, which is fine. Uh, but this one I think is because it hits on a couple of things as well as it being right on a lake and it has its own like, you know, area where you can dock and we have paddle boards and um, kayaks and things that they can use when they're there. And so adding those amenities, they can fish, you know, off the dock that we have our private dock. So, um, this one did have a lot of unique features that you wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, but all that to say, it's if you don't have that, then I think you could still do well by finding a place that if you can maximize the number of beds and then you still provide a lot of interesting or cool amenities. Like we have this cabin that we just closed on. That one was a seller financing one. So that one was cool because, you know, we have like a 4.5% interest rate. So that's awesome. Um, and only 15% down. So that was great. But uh, so this one, you know, we just, we lived in the area where like, man, it's just, it would be so easy just to add a few little fun amenities. I mean, things like, it's not even that expensive, but we're adding like a tether ball, um, just like a pole with a ball and we're just going to, you know, get the concrete, but like outside, like people can play tether ball or, um, you know, we were going to add like a little obstacle course. That's probably phase two. Um, but, you know, adding like this like game table that converts into like, a game board table with billiards or um, what's called bumper pool. Like that's another thing. So adding some of these things that are unique to your property that maybe no, no other ones have is uh, I think another way to captivate the audience that is looking for some of these unique places. Like the cabin itself isn't really unique, but we're going to make it more unique by having some of these cool amenities that, I mean, we just, you know, it's just a little extra cost and that's it, but it's going to cash flow so much more. Yeah. I love that. So let's, uh, let's bring this all together. Um, what would be your advice to someone that is, you know, five years behind you in their journey, that's wanting to get into real estate investing, that's want wanting to own midterm, you know, short-term rentals, long-term rentals, wanting, wanting to do some unique stuff, wanting to kind of add their own, um, touch to the property and, and create some unique experiences for their guests. What would be your advice for somebody wanting to get into this? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, location is still definitely everything. And if you don't get your location right, you're not going to do well. So even paying more for a property because it's in a better location uh, will likely benefit you better right than one that's not in a good location as long as it's just not you know you still have to run your numbers and you still got to be conservative you can't just automatically think oh just because it's in a great location and it costs like five hundred thousand dollars more you're going to cash flow no that's not going to work so uh, i'd say that as well as you know at this point i think there's a lot more creative opportunities to maybe seller finance so finding some of those like for example the cabin that we just bought you know, he's had it forever, right? And he's older and he's just, he's ready to just be done. Like he, he, I guess he's selling off. He had like 26 cabins in the area and this was one of his last ones. He was like, I'm just selling them off. I'm done with short. I don't want to do that. And this one had been on the market for a while. And, uh, but then I saw that it was, you know, we finally had dropped the price and said seller financing available. So it was one of those where I'm like, okay, he's willing to negotiate maybe a creative process, creative deal that could work because truthfully, if I bought it at that price, even at this, the interest rate we have right now, it would not cash flow well, like no matter what. So you do have to be willing to go the extra mile, I think, to look for either those creative financing deals, maybe seller or the owners that are just tired, or maybe some, some are like 
some are investors. They've gotten into the game in the last couple of years and they realize I don't really like short term rentals or I don't really want to have those. Like I think I'd rather do long term. I know a gal, she's she's offloading four of her short term rentals, even though they do really well. But she's like, I just don't feel like this is this is the type of asset I want to work with anymore. And so you can get some really good opportunities there. Um, so yeah, the combination of also just looking at like good location and those creative financing opportunities, I think that is where you can do really well as an investor at this time. That's really, really great information. Rachel, this this has been awesome. Um, now, how can our listeners provide value to you? Oh, gosh. You know, I... Um, you know, I used to back when I was an author and I had like even coaching programs and I was always trying to like, honestly, I, I don't, I don't, I know. I just, I just want to, you, you could just reach out via Instagram. That's basically where I'm at is Rachel C. Swanson. And then they can just reach out and ask me questions. Like they don't have to provide value. I just, I just get lit up by if they just look at my stuff, that's free that I'm sharing. And, um, you know, they say if something's changed their life or whatever. So I have gotten a lot of people who, um, you know, by some of just the stuff I've been sharing, they've reached out and said, Hey, like, I just want to let you know, you know, a couple months ago, you shared this. And now I actually took the leap and I'm doing this. And this is what's happened now. And it's like already I'm generating cash flow. And that's like the best feeling. But um, yeah, so that's absolutely. That's yeah, I'm gonna go follow you after this. Because I mean, uh, mid midterm rental is not my my overall strategy, but I'm definitely it's definitely something that's in there. So yeah, it has a place in my heart, I guess I can say. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to follow you. So if you want any 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 direction towards midterm rental, please go ahead and follow Rachel. Um, I believe your treehouse is on Airbnb, right? So if yeah, Airbnb if you, and Verbo, and then we do have a direct link as well. So okay, so if you want if you want to try that, check that out. It's in Texas, right? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half outside of Houston. So it's, uh, you could, or maybe it's actually 45 minutes from that airport, Houston airport. So you could fly in, have an awesome epic family vacation, and then <laughs> fly out again if you're not in the area. Sounds good. If you are listening to this episode on Spotify, be sure to subscribe and like our channel on YouTube. We're releasing content every day. Um, Josiah, how can people find out more about you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at Daily Real Estate Investor. And then if you go look my Instagram up, I've got a link tree on there that's got TikTok, my Bigger Pockets episode, my book, LinkedIn, Facebook. We have a Facebook group. So there's all kinds of, of resources there. Love to connect with you guys. Uh, super thankful that you tune into our show. Um, we're always, Tony and I are always trying to provide as much value for you guys as we can. And we'd love to get some feedback, you know, reach out to us, let us know what we can do to add more value to you. And uh, we'll keep trying to bring people like Rachel on, let them share their stories, because this has added a lot of value to me. I know that. So, um, yeah, Tony, uh, what do you got, man? Where can people find more about you? Did you already say that? Not not me. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I am <laughs> I, I am an Ant1234 Moreno. Oh, it's ant, as an ant. Easy as one, <laughs> no, two, three, one, four. Two, there you go. But I got <laughs> yeah. a four. I got a four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but yeah, uh, but most of my, you know, most of my content I posted on my Instagram. And then me and Josiah, we're trying to grow the Daily Real Estate Investor YouTube channel. So please uh, subscribe, hit the bell button so you can get notifications of when we post on there. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening and we'll see you on the next episode.